are many things even the wisest of us do not know. Welcome to the Amazing Trade Shop Science Race. I'm your host, Professor Eddie, speaking to you from the porch of Richard Charlton's 18th century coffee house in Colonial Williamsburg's historic area. Okay, I'm not really a professor, and this isn't really the 18th century, but I guarantee that this is Richard Charlton's coffee house, painstakingly reconstructed on its original foundation using a mix of modern and colonial tools and techniques. And that's what the amazing trade shop science race is all about. We are going behind the scenes with two competing teams to discover how Colonial Williamsburg's tradespeople helped with the reconstruction of this historic building and discover the science behind their work. Yep, I said it, science. Oh, here come the teams now. On the red team, we have Amara hey. and Dylan. Hi. And on the blue team, we have Shannon and Kenneth. The thrill seekers. These digital devices will provide the teams with maps and videos to help them on their discoveries. No, uh, yeah. red. Oh. <laughs> and help me remember who's the blue team and who's the red team. <laughs> and now the rules. Each team will visit three historic area trades, each which have contributed to the rebuilding of the Charlton Coffee House. Your mission is to look for the science behind their work. Be on the lookout for uh, physical changes, uh, chemical changes, uh, simple machines, and transfers of energy. I'll be keeping score and providing engaging commentary to our viewers. <laughs> uh, the team that comes back with the most points will be our winner. Everybody ready? Ready. Get set, go. The red team is heading down Duke of Gloucester Street in search of the Anderson Blacksmith Shop, while the blue team, well, they catch the bus to Great Hope's Plantation. Red team is approaching the Anderson Blacksmith Shop now. <laughs> Very exciting. So, what did you make for the coffee house? <laughs> they don't waste any time, do they? Right here, this hinge. Would it be considered as a wheel and axle? Score one for the red team. Okay. It is indeed a wheel and axle. So this could be the wheel, even though it's not round, and this right here is the axle? The center part is the axle, and both of the sides would perhaps be spokes of a wheel. Okay. Wow, look at this key and lock. Hey, this key would be a lever, right? Red team scores their second point. Right. Lever, or perhaps a wheel and axle. When you turn the key, it operates the parts of an engine, a complex machine. So right here, these nails, would they con be considered as wedges? Did you say wedges? They are wedges, though. The wedging action is to move things apart, and you really want a nail to hold things together. So you have to be okay. certain that you don't split the board when you drive it in. So how do you make all this stuff? I believe that you have some video that'll That's right. yeah. start us on this journey. Can anyone stop their mechanical mail? I love movies. <laughs> what tools do you see? Well, there's a hammer right there used to bend the metal. Oh, a hammer is a class three lever. Too bad the red team didn't notice. And an anvil. The anvil backs up the hammer, so you're squeezing between two separate tools. I guess the fire would maybe be a tool. Fire is a very important tool, and there's one more tool that we haven't seen. Perhaps we can walk over here and look at that. Ooh, a mystery tool. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the blue team arrives at Great Hope's Plantation to meet the carpenters. Hi, welcome to Great Hope's Plantation. Are you guys here for the amazing trade shop science race? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, great. Let's walk over here and take a look at what's going on. Well, what do you think he's doing here? He's cutting the wood. Well, he's not actually cutting it, he's splitting it. So the fibers are being separated as opposed to being uh, cut. What simple machine is he using here? It's a wedge, right? The blue team scores with a wedge! Yeah. He's driving that down into the wood, but once he buries that into the wood, what other simple machine is going to be used? It's a lever. And again! Yeah. He's going to use the handle as a lever, and as, as you see him press that down, you can see how it starts to separate the material. The material he's working up is going to be plaster lath. What is plaster lath? It's what goes on to the frame of the building, and it's what helps to support the plaster that you're going to smear onto the walls to help make the walls nice and smooth. You guys want to try? Sure. Oh. The mall is another class three lever, like the hammer. Blue team missed that one. But speaking of hammers, what about that mystery tool back at the blacksmith shop? Oh, it's a bellows. It is. That's a lever, isn't it? Yes, it is, Dylan. Red team widens their lead. Why do you need a bellows? 
I guess because it pumps air up and it makes the fire hotter, right? Doubles the heat of the fire, very important. Why don't we try twisting something cold to see why you need a fire? Let's go back to the vise over here. The vise is a wheel and axle. Come on, guys, the vise. And the tongs are a lever. Hello? It really is hard. You want to try? Sure. I will become master of the universe. Oh, yeah, you're right. Soon be ready. Can you see the changes occurring to the piece in the fire now? It's changing color. And the color is the same as the fire behind it. It'll be time to walk over to the, to the vise and twist it. Are we ready yet? Oh. Need to move quickly because it'll cool off quickly. Wow, that's really easy. A lot easier than before. Whoa, what's all those flakes coming out? That's oxidation that occurs in a fire. A chemical change, right? A chemical it is a chemical change! <laughs> Come on now. So what can you tell me about this video? Let me see what you got. Where's Kenneth? I don't know. Hello. Hey, what are you guys looking at? Oh, this is the uh, Charlton Coffee House when we raised the front wall. Can you guys see any kind of simple machines in here that we're using? Well, I see a couple of bullies. Yeah. Police we are score using blue a team of one point. And actually, this whole wall initially we started with with manpower, but we use these uh, pulleys to help take up the load. Can you see anything else that we're using there? I see a lever. Yeah, we're using some Four. levers to gain uh, some advantage at the top of the wall as well. And that was a good day of work, but now I think I'm gonna put you guys to work. So let's go over here and try this out. Now this cart is called a timber cart or a drug, and we're gonna use this cart to move those heavy timbers like you saw in the video of a coffee house. That's how we transport timbers from one point to another. Now. What, what, what do you see on this cart that's going to help us, obviously, to transport it? How about a wheel and axle? Exactly. That's yes! That's the first real uh, obvious simple machine. But there's one that's not quite as obvious. I tell you, Kenneth, start to lift up on this handle. What is this starting to do here? What do we got here? It's like a lever. Blue team takes the lead. Where's the fulcrum on this lever? Where the wheel and axle meet the beam. Exactly. Another point for blue. This, this tongue is very heavy right now, and it's done intentionally that way, so that when we push this cart over the timber, we're going to off-center that center point of the fulcrum. And that way, when we start to pull down on this cart to lift the timber, we're going to take advantage of the natural weight of that beam. You must find strength. See that lever working with a good fulcrum there. Well, the score is blue team seven and red team five. We'll be back soon with round two. Oh, oh, oh. My head is spinning. Welcome back. The score is blue team seven and red team five. Red team is entering their next trade shop. Let's listen. This is a kitchen. What is there to have to do with the coffee house? Hmm. Good question, Amara. We'll get back to that in a minute. But meanwhile, You're Blue Team foundry, is getting started in the foundry. Do you all know the difference between a foundry and a smith shop? Well, don't smiths pound metal to make it into the shape that they want? Exactly. And here in a foundry, we melt the metal. How do you suppose I'm going to shape melted metal? Well, you put it in the molds. Exactly. So I have different kinds of metals that I work with here in this foundry, and some of the metals are the same metals that smiths work with. What do you all suppose some of these metals are? And these are metals that we've alloyed. What is an alloy? An alloy is a mixture of metals as opposed to an elemental metal, which is in its pure form. All of the metals we work with are mixtures. So what do you think that this is? Hmm. It could be brass. It is, exactly. Brass is a mixture of copper and zinc. What about this metal? Silver. Exactly, sterling silver. So it's a mixture of 92.5% pure silver and 7.5% copper. This might be a hard one. We don't use this metal very often. Mm, is it bronze? Bronze, exactly. It's the same thing a cannon or a bell is made out of. Bronze is copper and tin. What about this? This is pretty tarnished. Lead? 
It looks like lead and it has lead in it. It's an alloy of pewter. Pewter is tin. Sometimes it has lead or bismuth or antimony mixed in it. This is what pewter looks like shiny. It's a nuclear device. Here in the colonies, they're not alloying or mixing their metals. They're taking metal that you brought in as a customer that was broken and worn out and melting it. What do we call that today? We do it with bottles and cans. Recycling? Recycling, exactly. So you bring in your old buckles, we weigh them out, melt them, and then pour that metal into a mold. Now we make the mold or build the mold by taking a model of the item, a mock-up of it, and packing wet sand around it. Sand is packed so tightly that it holds the shape of the object. The object that comes out looks like this. We'll take a saw and cut this off and do the finishing work. It's gonna actually look like this. Let's look at one of the other types of molds. This is a brass mold, and you can pour this metal pewter into a brass mold because the pewter has a lower melting temperature than brass. Now, we don't have a temperature guide, but I know that this is around maybe 600 degrees as a liquid, and when I make something out of brass, it's going to be around 2,000 degrees. So I can pour pewter into brass, and it will not melt my brass mold. <laughs> well, out of the fire and into the frying pan. <laughs> Yikes! <laughs> These are roasting chocolate beans. I <laughs> Turns out Red Team is gonna make chocolate to serve in the coffee house. Oh, <laughs> let's check it out. <laughs> Ow! Ow! So what do you do after the beans have been roasted? Well, what we have to do is we have to shell them. Each and every bean has a shell around them. So as they take these nuts, you can see as we pull it off, you have to separate. This is what you eat, this is what you can't eat. Hold on, is this a nut, a bean, or a seed? Well, Dylan, it's actually all three. Go ahead and hand me that pod right there. This is the cacao pod as it's growing, and these are the seeds that come out of this fruit. However, in the 18th century, we called them chocolate nuts or cocoa nuts, and in the 19th century, we called them cocoa beans. So actually, they're all three. So go ahead and start shelling all of these. You guys get to shell these for about two hours. So I'll, uh, I'll be back in the Two hours, huh? We'll come back, too. What is this? The bellows to heat the fire. Exactly. Now, what kind of simple machine is this? Eleven. Blue team scores! Now, if we were pouring brass, we would pump the bellows about an hour, melting the metal in a crucible, special melting pot made of clay and graphite, and then pour the metal into that sand mold that we made for the finials. You want to try that out, Kenneth? Yeah. OK. Just grab the tongs and clip it in. Kenneth is preparing to pour invisible brass. It's a good thing the crucible is not filled with 2,000 degree molten metal, or Kenneth's fingerprints would be gone. Time flies when you're shelling cacao beans. So how's it going? Well, where are the seeds? You didn't separate them, did you? I guess we could pick them out one by one. Or we could have separated them while we were shelling. We have another way of doing it, too. Oh, winnowing the winnowing basket. We have a video of that. Roll it! You throw the seeds up in the air and let the wind blow the chaff away. Now, we can't pour brass today, but we can pour pewter. Now, the metal is in the pot in a liquid form here in the furnace. I'm going to scoop it out with my iron ladle, pour it into my brass mold. How long do you think it's going to take before I can open up my mold and we can have a spoon? Time is running out. It's actually already hard. Wow. Very quick. Now, this is much too hot to handle, but you can see how it's a solid. Now, I mentioned earlier taking old and broken things and reusing them. Let me scoop in so you all can see this metal. If I have a spoon that's broken or worn out, I could put it back into the metal and remelt it. Shannon, would you like to melt a spoon? Sure. Now remember, everything's very hot. Talk about changes in state. Too bad Blue Team missed that point. Liquid to solid, solid to liquid. So now, 
we're gonna make chocolate. What do we add to that? Well, actually, nothing. It's already in it. Uh, when we grind it, it's gonna turn to a liquid. If you don't add anything, how does it become a liquid? Well, you're familiar with coffee, aren't you? What happens when you grind a coffee bean? It turns to powder. Right, because coffee doesn't have any fat in it. Cocoa, on the other hand, has is about 50% fat, so when you grind it, it will turn to a liquid. You take the nut or the bean or the seed or whatever you want to call it, and it still has 50% fat, and that's called cocoa butter. You guys want to try this? Sure. Okay. Come on, Amara. Go ahead and grind away. Or you can see underneath that we have a little bit of a heat uh, source there. That's to transfer the uh, heat to the stone, so kind of keep the chocolate in its liquid form. Transfer of energy, right? Red team scores! It'll be a while before they have liquid chocolate, though. Here's how it'll look when they're done. Yummy. The teams have one more round. And blue team is holding their lead with eight points to red team six. See you in a bit. That's right. Welcome back. Blue team has a two point lead as they enter the final round. They are headed to the brickyard now. Let's join the red team at the joinery where they're learning about plaster. So this is plastering at the coffee house. And the material he's applying it to is called lac and the lath has holes in it, so the plaster pushes through and it attaches to the wall. So what I thought we would do is we would make a little bit of plaster and it's gonna be a little bit messy, so here are some shirts and let's get to work. This sounds fun. Plaster's made out of about 45% lime putty. Hold on, wait a minute. What's lime putty? Lime putty is made from shell and in this case, it's made from oyster shell. What we do is we take the shell, which is calcium carbonate, and we burn it. And when we burn it, we drive off moisture and carbon dioxide. Get out of here, you! And that makes a material called calcium oxide. And do you know what type of reaction that is? That would be a chemical reaction, right? What do you say? I don't know. A chemical reaction, right? Score another point for the Reds. Correct, very good. And so from there, we then add water. When we add water, all that moisture and carbon dioxide starts to come back into the material, and it creates calcium hydroxide, also known as lime putty. So that's lime putty. Where were we? All the plaster's made out of about 45% lime putty, 45% sand, 7% clay, and what we use that for is called a plasticizer. It makes the plaster very sticky and makes it go on very smooth. And about 3% brick dust. The bricks have silica in them or sand. And when that silica gets really hot, it forms a material called a pozzolan. And the pozzolan, when added to our plaster, helps it cure a little bit faster as well as makes it, makes it much harder. And now we can go ahead and mix up our plaster. Let's see what the blue team is doing. So what can you tell me about this? Well, it's brick and it's red. And it's red. What makes it red, though? Well, there's a lot of iron in the clay that the brick is made out of. Well, how does the iron turn it red? Well, when we cook the clay in the kiln, the iron will go through a chemical change. Rats! No score in that chemical change. Too bad. And turn everything red. Is clay the only thing in a brick? Clay and water. That's it. We're stepping in it right now. Are you wondering why they wobble? Oh, look, our feet are like wedges. Wedges! Score one for the blues. How do you make the clay into a brick? I'll show you. Come over here. So this type of mixture is called a colloid, and that means that one material is evenly dispersed in another, but it doesn't dissolve. It just floats there. And so the very important part in paint is that we get this very even, or we'll get globs. So we're gonna grab the muller, which is this right here, and you can go ahead and set that on top and start grinding in a circular pattern. And you'll do this until all the little chunks and they are all completely ground in and it's nice and smooth. So what we've done is I've already made some and all the ground pigments are now on this slab. What we want to get is a nice tan color. You'll see it start to change color. You see the tan coming out now? This is a little thick for paint. So what we would do 
is we would add a little bit of linseed oil. So we grind seven, seven gallons of putty, we add oil, we make about 15 gallons of paint. Oh, huh. Jason is showing the blue team how they form bricks. Brickmakers made 10,000 bricks for the coffee house, just like this. It's two bricks. What do you do with the bricks now? Well, now we have to dry them. So we'll set them out in the sun to dry over on that, on that drying bed for a couple of days until it gets nice and hard. And then we'll move it into that big shed over there where we can dry the bricks for weeks and get them even drier. And that's evaporation. That's science! Put the water in the clay and then evaporate it out. And that a change in state. One point for the blue team. But we still have to cook it. Oh, we have a video of that. Roll it! So the kiln fires for a week. And those tunnels where the fires burn underneath all the bricks have to be fed day and night, the whole fire. Where did the tunnels go to? All the way across the bottom, but the bricks on the bottom by the fire tunnels are going to be a lot hotter than some of the other bricks in the kiln, and that means they'll come out different colors. The different colors in the bricks might tell the bricklayer where he's going to use that when he builds the walls of the coffin house. But a bricklayer needs two things if he's going to build a wall. He needs bricks and mortar, mortar right, which is made out of burnt oyster shells. We have a video of that too. You do? Let's take a look at that. Roll it! Lime is made from oyster shells that you burn. And burning the oyster shells removes carbon dioxide from them. When you put a burnt oyster shell in water, it chemically changes into lime. More lime putty. We <laughs> putty. That chemical change also creates a lot of heat. So you might see a lot of steam when we make lime. Now we're going to talk a little bit about shellac. And shellac is made from this material right here and this is called lac. And so what lac is, is, lac actually comes from little bugs that live in a tree. The bugs suck the sap out of the tree and then excrete a material onto the branches. Say what? Bug excretions? Cool. The lac is the solute and the alcohol is the solvent. And we mix the two together, what happens? Well, it's starting to dissolve. That's right. So you have one material that dissolves into another, and that creates a solution, which is shellac. And so as we apply that, what's happening is you're sealing the surface, and it protects the wood, as well as it gives us a really nice finished coat. Oh, man, we should have said that the dissolving shellac was a chemical change. Wait, it's not too late. Score one for the red team. Well, the teams are headed back to the coffee house now. Looks like we have a winner. <sighs> Here they come now. Welcome back, teams. Hey, guys. Hey. Hi. May I have your digital devices, please? Thank you. Well, the final team scores will now be revealed. Don't you just hate those long, drawn-out build-ups to reveal the winners? <laughs> Let's get right to it. Well, the score is red team eight points and blue team 10. The blue team is the winner of the amazing Trade Shop Science Race. Good job, guys. Nice Good job. job. Well done, Amar and Dylan. You kept it neck and neck through most of the race, uh, while well, identifying levers, wedges, several chemical changes, and a transfer of energy. Here are your runner-up haversacks for a game well played. Thanks. Thank you. Shannon and Kenny, congratulations on your winning scores. You identified multiple wedges, levers, in addition to pulleys, fulcrums, and a change in state. Here are your first place haversacks filled with all kinds of stuff. And that's our show from the Charlton Coffee House in Colonial Williamsburg's historic area. I'm Professor Eddie, and we'll see you next week on... You don't expect me to believe that. Okay, okay. So I'm not really a professor, and we won't really see you next week. Huh? But I still hope you enjoyed the, the amazing, amazing Trade Shop Science Race.